Hello and welcome back to CMIS 468 Chapter 4, Long Time No Talk, literally, because I've not been able to talk. Uh, today's the first day that I feel like my voice is just about back to normal. Um, this uh, cold kicked my ass and I hope you guys are staying healthy is all I'm going to say about that. So Chapter 4 is, um, uh, there have been a lot of changes in Chapter 4 from uh, the ninth edition to the 10th edition of the textbook, so I have to give you a little quick introduction. But, the original Chapter 4 was all about network design and network management, and now the author, uh, Panko, has changed it to uh, just network management and security management, which I think is a mistake, and here's why. I think if you uh, talk about network management without talking about design, specifically if you do not design for management in the future, it's a mistake, and you're, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Uh, so that's why I'm going to uh, bring up some... Uh, design topics in this chapter because I think it it behooves you to to hear some of uh, some of the tie-in. Uh, so the chapter is odd because it talks about network management, and then it goes off on a tangent on security management, and then back to network management. So we're going to skip around just a little bit as an added bonus, free added bonus, no extra charge for this. I'm going to give you uh, Tim's three principles for good network design. So just things that just rules of thumb that I've learned about network design over the years that I want to share with you just to help you out. So with that, and so I've kind of kept the, the title of network design and security management, but I know the chapter is called just network management. So the first thing is, uh, and Panko kind of misses this now in the new edition, but the, the most important thing, the most important thing driving your design, driving network management, driving every decision that you make about your, your network, and it's, it's not the layers. Yes, the layers is the most important thing in this, in this uh, course. But in this chapter, the most important thing that drives all your network decisions is always business requirements. Not technology. Technology doesn't drive your company. Business requirements drive your company. So every networking decision you make, every security decision you make, has to be driven by business requirements. And I can't stress that enough. For example, I mean, you should know this intuitively, uh, in the security arena, you're not going to spend a dollar to protect a dime. Does that make sense? You're not going to spend more money uh, in your security environment than your information is worth to protect. Same thing with, with your network. There's no point in over-provisioning over and, and having uh, the world's best network if your business doesn't need it. Then you're just wasting money. Um, vice versa, if you're not uh, meeting the business requirements, you need to spend more money on the, the network. This is how you start to justify, you know, build a, a business case for building an outstanding network. So when you're building a, a network, there, uh, there are a number of QoS, quality of service, uh, things to keep in mind. Uh, at a high level, these are speed, availability, and cost. Um, we're going to delve into speed and availability kind of in, in depth here. Uh, I like this graphic in the, the new edition um, in terms of metrics that you can you can measure. And this is what network managers do measure. Uh, transmission speed, availability as a percentage, uh, errors on the network, whether it's errors from your switches, from your routers, from your firewalls, um, from the ISP itself uh, over your, your WAN line, and then latency. Uh, and part of that can be measured with good old-fashioned uh, ping. And a lot of very expensive network management tools just use ping on the back end to determine latency and give you a, a fancy graph. But uh, ping gives you an awful lot of information. Uh, I do want to make sure you're comfortable with the, the right way to talk about network transmission speed. Uh, you would never talk about 3,000 megabits per second. It's just silly. Uh, that's 3.6 gigabits per second. Similarly, you would never talk about 0 0.3 megabits per second. That's just 300 kilobits per second. It's a metric thing, and it's, uh, it's just the way uh, networking people uh, talk about speed. And... Uh, this is one that everybody always nods their head and says that they understand and they miss it on the exam. And I laugh every time. I just laugh because you say you understand, but you don't, you don't remember that there's a difference between rated speed and throughput. And the difference is, is simply this. Rated speed is what you're paying for. That's the max. That's what you're supposed to be getting from your ISP, uh, no matter who your, your ISP is and, and what type of WAN connection you, you have. Or even on the LAN side, the rated speed is what the system should get. Throughput is reality. That's what you're really getting. So you want to measure your throughput to see if 
how it compares with your rated speed. And that's what the, the speed test and the first assignment is all about, is comparing uh, actual throughput with your rated speed. And if there's a big difference, you should be calling up your ISP and complaining, because now you have evidence that you're not getting what you pay for. Uh, yeah, and the, the new topic in the book, that, uh, in terms of aggregate throughput through uh, versus individual throughput is uh, a fair point to make, but I think it's a pretty, pretty obvious one. Uh, the larger problem is trying to figure out how much is enough, how much bandwidth is enough, how much bandwidth do you need to provision uh, on, on the LAN and on the, the WAN side. Um, it's, it's a tough question. Uh, in my mind, nobody's ever complained about having too much bandwidth. That said, it is possible to over provision. So uh, just some, some tips, uh, kind of my, my sarcastic answer would be how much bandwidth can you afford? Um, you know, just max out the budget, but uh, remember that you've got fixed costs in the, the hardware and equipment and variable costs in terms of the, the monthly, uh, the monthly bill for your bandwidth, at least on the WAN side. It's going to be a fixed cost on the LAN side. Uh, if it's easy to upgrade your bandwidth later, there's no need to do it initially. Um, but if it's going to be inconvenient to upgrade later, that's a factor. One quick example. Uh, when you're provisioning wide area network circuits uh, in another country, um, a, a, a WAN circuit in the U.S. is going to take at least 30 days to provision. Why so long? I don't know. That's just what the telco tells you, at least 30 days. Internationally, it's usually like 90 days. So that if you wanted to reprovision a circuit, you'd have to let your, your business executives know, okay, you're going to have to wait 90 days before I can make this change. Uh, that's something to keep in mind when you're initially setting things up. But talking to vendors and resellers, you know, understanding that they want to sell you something, but at the same time, they, they do this uh, hundreds of times a year with different customers. And so they're going to have some expertise on this and you want to listen to what they have to say as well. Uh, network simulation, I've never seen um, really work out well. The, the only way to know how it's going to work out is to, to do it live, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, it's a trial and error uh, process, uh, so so if at all possible, try to plan for more bandwidth than you think you're going to need. Just my personal recommendation. Later in the course, we get into some of the differences between uh, LAN and WAN, but I want to bring up this point uh, now. That just remember, in, with a LAN, you're in control over you're in control over the bandwidth because you're setting up the the switches and the cabling. You're in total control of the, the bandwidth and troubleshooting errors and latency and, and all that. With the WAN, you have no control whatsoever, un unless it's a private WAN and you control the, the routers at uh, both ends and it's a private lease line. But if it's a, a shared line like a Frame Relay or MPLS, um, we'll get into this uh, later, these are WAN protocols, you're at the mercy of the, the telco, the telephone company, telco, uh, or your, your ISP. You have to rely on them to... Uh, troubleshoot, which means you have to have a really good relationship with your uh, WAN provider. So when you're, when you're ordering a, a circuit, um, a WAN circuit, do not, do not call up um, AT&T, Verizon, whoever your local Sprint, whoever your local provider is and say, yes, I would like to order a WAN. Can you, can you give me your finest WAN? No, that's not how we, how we talk. You, uh, you don't order, uh, you, you provision a circuit. Um, uh, if you want to kind of give them a heads up that you know the, the lingo, and this really helps to use the right language. Uh, just remember that business bandwidth is very different from residential bandwidth. Uh, we'll talk about why later, but it really comes down to SLAs. Um, the type of WAN line that you can order uh, in the U.S. is pretty broad. In other countries can be very narrow, and in some uh, remote parts of uh, foreign countries, your options are very, very limited. So please never assume in the real world that you can just order a, you know, a gig connection out into the jungle of you know, wherever. You might be stuck with an ISDN line, an old-fashioned uh, 128K line. Um, could be dial-up, that worst-case scenario. Might be satellite, which is a pretty crappy scenario. Um, might be an older T1 line or an E1 line in Europe because they have a different standard, E1 lines instead of T1 lines. Uh, and remember that WAN lines can be either public or private. So a public WAN is using the Internet. So basically you'd be using a VPN over a, a public WAN. A private WAN is much more secure but much more expensive. Uh, so you have a lot of, a lot of options. 
The other advantage of a uh, WAN, a uh, private WAN line, it's more expensive. However, again, you're totally in control of the bandwidth because you own that entire circuit. Um, so you, you have 100% of the, the bandwidth, whereas if it's a, uh, a less expensive multiplexed technology, um, you're, you're not in control of the bandwidth. You're at the mercy of the, the ISP. Availability is another uh, measurement in addition to speed. So not just how fast it is, but how, uh, how much it's up. So if you, even at home, you've, you've experienced uh, internet outages, I'm sure, from Charter, whoever your provider is. So for businesses, that's, it's not cool. It's not cool for your, <laughs> for the ISP to be offline for any, any period of time, even if it's a few minutes. So businesses measure how many nines. Uh, how many nines can you give me is the, the lingo here. How many nines refers to the number of nines after the decimal point. 99.9% uh, .9 uptime sounds good, but when you uh, measure that out over a year, it actually is many, many hours of downtime, which is probably bad. Most people want uh, 0.999 up to five nines after the decimal. Um, so uh, be aware of that language. Uh, Error rates are obviously bad because uh, if a frame uh, doesn't go through, it has to be re retransmitted, which causes more traffic. So more more errors means more congested, congestion, uh, like I'm feeling right now in, in my voice. Congestion. So uh, uh, errors can be caused by a lot of things. Errors can be caused by noise on the line, um, a faulty cable somewhere. Frequently it can be caused by duplex mismatch. I think we'll talk about duplex mismatches later on, but let me go ahead and mention that you can specify on your network card and on a Cisco, sorry, any switch port, I'm just a, a whore for Cisco, uh, on a switch port you can specify the duplex setting. Now the, the default is auto, to auto negotiate, it'll, it'll pick the best uh, option. So your options are uh, half duplex 10 megabit, full duplex 10 megabit, half duplex 100 megabit, full duplex 100 megabit uh, and and so forth auto negotiate should pick the highest level that it, that it can go and if it's you know gigabit per second full full duplex that's what it'll do full duplex means send and receive go at the same time half duplex means send then receive then send then receive so it's half as efficient so full duplex is better but a lot of times for a long distance circuit so i've had to do this sometimes you have to stop it down to half duplex just to reduce the errors on the line. And a lot of times your users don't notice that you've done this. So just something to keep in mind. Also, a lot of devices, Cisco is bad for this. They used to be bad for this, that you had to uh, manually set the duplex setting. That if you let it auto, it would just wouldn't, especially if a Cisco box was talking to another brand box, they just couldn't auto negotiate the right way and they kept kind of flickering back and forth. And so uh, hard coding this on both sides can be helpful just in my personal experience. Another uh, measure of quality of service is uh, latency, and you, you've seen this in the, the ping millisecond responses. Uh, you really want kind of just two, um, uh, two digits, like 30 millisecond or, or less is, is great. Um, you know, over 100 milliseconds is when I start to raise my eyebrow, and certainly over 250 would be uh, terrible. Uh, latency. 250 milliseconds doesn't sound like a lot, but it would severely impact um, phone conversations and certainly your games would get laggy at that point. And the last thing uh, here is jitter. I've got jitter in green because I'm not going to test you on jitter. It's a little more advanced uh, topic, but in terms of uh, variation in latency where sometimes it you know, jumps up to 400 milliseconds and then down to 10 and then 500 and then 20 and it's just all over the place. Jitter is one of the hardest things to uh, troubleshoot because it's difficult to recreate. Uh, so I'm going to pause here and we'll have to start another video and we'll talk about service level agreements.